Well, hi there, everyone. Welcome to Interchange. I'm Dan Jones. Thank you so much for joining us. Lots to talk about again today, the Gulf oil spill. It's been a month now, and it's still not under control. Can anyone be blamed for this? We'll talk about faculty members at Marquette University trying to embarrass the school into hiring a lesbian dean. And we'll talk about the virtually meaningless move by MATC to stop doing any business with Arizona. And we will talk about whether this zillionaire Republican Ron Johnson has any chance of knocking Russ Feingold out of his Senate job. Joining us now, our newspaper columnist, Joel McNally. Kevin Fisher, aide to Republican State Senator Mary Lazic, and oftentimes a host over at WISN Radio. Denise Calloway is the Communications Director for the Greater Milwaukee Foundation. And Gerard Randall, a consultant and job creation expert. Rick Horowitz will be along with commentary at the end of the show. All right, let's get right into it. They keep trying to stop the oil from gushing into the Gulf of Mexico, but nothing, nothing seems to be working. It has now been a month, and it's the worst oil spill ever in America. President Obama says he's on top of it, but I don't think that gives anybody any comfort. Isn't it amazing <laughs> that we don't have the technology to fix this? Well, it, it, it is amazing that we don't have the days. technology to fix it, but I, I'm of the impression that... Uh, what technology was available to them to stop the, uh, the leak, uh, as it were, um, they didn't employ. And they didn't employ it because they had hopes that they would be able to contain it uh, and ultimately go back and use that same well uh, to uh, draw oil from as they had initially planned. Once you cap it off, as they've ultimately gotten around to doing, they can't use that well anymore. And there were billions of dollars in revenue that they won't realize as a result. Now they're going to end up spending billions to try to rectify the environmental harm that's been caused. So it was a no-win situation all the way around. They should have taken the step of capping it off, using the technology that was available to cap it off. They used all kinds of methods to, uh, to string this thing out, hoping that they would somehow or the other be able to get the well repaired. That clearly didn't work, and the government didn't step in to say, look, this is a failed attempt uh, to make this thing work after even the first couple weeks. They didn't do that, and they would have been able to have, I believe, staved off some of the damage that uh, has now been caused to the environment, to BP's reputation, and frankly, uh, to the president's administration uh, politically. Denise, a lot of people are trying to trying to blame Obama, and you can tell that the administration is, is fighting back and reacting. I don't know if you can blame Obama. I mean, we obviously don't have the technology to fix it right now. Otherwise, we'd be doing something, so... You know, we don't have the technology. To, I, I think the technology exists to fix it. The problem is BP is not aware of what that technology is or it's not accessing that technology. I, I would agree with what Gerard said, but take it back one step further. The problem is there were changes and compromises that were made with a whole blowout protector. So if that would have been done appropriately and properly, we wouldn't be in the situation where we'd be trying to figure out now, almost 40 days after this, how we're going to stop this incredible disaster that is happening. Um, and the other problem that we have is that Right now, the oil industry is the only industry that has the ability and has the, the submersible submarines, all of the other deep sea equipment um, that's needed to fix this. So the government can't go in and do this itself because literally it doesn't have the equipment to do it. But beyond that, we have not been careful in terms of how we went through the process of deciding that we would drill one mile down into the ocean floor without knowing that we had the technology to stop something like this if it happened. I mean, that's just a huge issue and problem. And part of it is the um, MMS department that oversees all of this under oversee drilling over the past nine years has been gutted in terms of its budget and its staff. That particular blowout preventer had not been inspected for five years. For five years. This was a disaster waiting to happen. What about, what about Car Carville the other day even blasting the president saying, he should be down here, why isn't he doing something, he should be doing more? I think he's been, he's been watching Treme too much in the John Goodman <laughs> character or something, but um, it, we know it, it isn't just, you know, that they didn't have it or they weren't doing it. It was corruption. It was years of corruption. It was the oil industry running the, the department that's supposed to have oversight over the oil industry and and regulate the oil industry. Uh, you know, it, it, it was eight years of a government led by two oil men. 
uh, who were supposed to do this. And then you had Republicans chanting drill, baby, drill, uh, saying we should just let the oil companies do anything they want, anywhere they want. Uh, it has been sickening to watch this stuff, and it's been especially sickening to watch it day after day after day. Once they put it on television, first of all, they put it on television, people could actually see how bad it was and, and dismiss the lies that were coming out of BP, uh, you know, saying only about a tenth of much, uh, uh, much oil as ultimately is coming out and still not stopped. Uh, you know, it, it, is, it is appalling. And, yeah, the government doesn't have, uh, you know, the underwater equipment to uh, a mile under the surface of the water repair this thing. And apparently BP doesn't either. And apparently we were so gung-ho, let these oil companies do whatever they want, that we didn't have regulation. We did not have oversight. We didn't make, we didn't require them to have backup systems if something failed, like, like this blowout protector. Uh, and it is, it is a sickening, disgusting thing to watch. Uh, but it, what also amazes me is all the people demanding that the government do something, the government do something. These are the people who didn't want government takeovers of anything, including a collapsing uh, financial system or the, or the car companies, uh, you know, just let them go out of business and let everybody in America be unemployed. Uh, now are saying you know, it's President Obama's fault. He should do something. He should get down there and, and plug it. Uh, that is absurd, uh, but I am glad that people recognize that we need government regulation, and I, we're finally going to get it as a result of this horrible, horrible accident. But uh, we should have had it anyway. It doesn't look like the government can do anything, though. It's not President Obama's fault. <laughs> about this, this oil spill is not his fault. Um, and there are things the government can and should do. Where the president comes under fire is his reaction to the oil spill. At least now we have a barometer of the threshold of impatience on the part of the mainstream news media uh, when something like this happens. For President Bush, when Katrina hit, it was basically two days before the, the firing squad came out. With <laughs> President Obama, it's been 35, 40 days. He's, he's had this attitude of, well, I've got to stick to my normal schedule. I'm just going to try to remain calm, yada, 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 yada. What we need is action and progress on the part of the president. And we have to work with BP. BP says this top, this top kill uh, solution is working. Maybe. Rema remains to be seen. It's not working fast enough. The president, in a rare moment by the press yesterday, uh, was questioned by a reporter who said, look, all of the so-called experts uh, uh, say you're not doing enough. You're not doing enough. You're not doing enough. So I think it's incumbent upon this administration to do enough. Otherwise, he needs to come under the same criticism as George W. George, Bush George for Bush, Katrina. George Bush, days went by, and George Bush didn't even know what was going on in Katrina. He didn't know what the American people president, knew. The American people knew there. by watching television. Uh, he didn't, he sent, you know, uh, a guy who used to run horse shows down there to run a disaster who was more worried about getting uh, re restaurant reservations in Baton Rouge than, than stopping people from dying in the streets. That, that America was watching dying. The president well, took over 30 days. There is no comparison here at all. Over 30 the president days has been on this instances. from the very beginning. No, the yes, the governor the has, but not the president. I, I, I will, I'm going to uh, agree with both of you in one aspect, and that is that the federal response has not been adequate. Part of the reason, Bingo. though, it hasn't been adequate is because you take a look at uh, MMS and, um, and um, uh, FEMA, both of those were departments where there had been severe cutbacks, so there wasn't the ability to fully understand what was happening or to respond. It's and it not wasn't so I think, I think, it was, it was I, corruption. I think, I think it was corruption. It was letting letting the people whose industries you know are supposed to be regulated run the regulation. I'm sure BP and, and didn't and want and this and to and happen. And no, no but, but the problem is, I don't. I agree with you. BP didn't want this to happen. But the problem is, we don't have enough watchdogs in place. On the side of the federal government, which ultimately is going to be responsible for this mess and cleaning it up, to make sure that these things don't happen. And we're going to, if we're going to take these chances, we've got to have systems and people in place to respond when disasters occur, and we don't have that. Right. All right. Next topic. Did you see that big ad in the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel the other day where all these faculty members from Marquette demanded that this gay dean candidate be apologized to and then hired? They all seemed so shocked that Marquette offered her a job, then rescinded the offer when they found out how bizarre some of her writing and research had been. 
Here's a surprise for the faculty. They don't run the school. Father Wilde does. Uh, and, and the trustees uh, and other administrators. I think uh, the big surprise is that the new archbishop has already clearly inserted himself uh, into uh, the mix uh, with Catholic higher ed in this community. Um, that, to me, was the big surprise. That Marquette was willing to listen to him uh, was also that, another surprise. surprise. Yeah. <laughs> um, and that they have held their ground on this. I, I firmly believe that uh, faculties have a right to um, academic freedom, uh, but that freedom comes also with some joint responsibility on their part as well. Uh, once you move into an administrative position, you're obligated at that point to carry the line of the administration. She was moving from faculty to administration. She then had to have her views consistent with those views of the administration, and if those views weren't consistent with administration, then she shouldn't have been in an administrative spot. I am disappointed that Marquette waited as long as it did to discover what her views were, especially given that they had already made uh, an offer to her once before, should have thoroughly vetted her, um, maybe had not done that, but I think that's they again had, where... And of course they uh, did. Uh, well, the, the, they, no, they absolutely no, had vetted her. I, I, they knew I, everything I, there was to know about her. They recruited not. her twice. They, they recruited her twice when, they didn't, when she didn't accept the job the first time. They reopened the search, and representatives of Father Wiles' office accompanied other people from the university to Seattle to ask her to apply again. Then she did apply again. Then they offered, they sent her a contract, and she signed it and she sent it back. That, that ad from the faculty was one of the first things out of Marquette that has made Marquette look like a decent university in this whole thing. Uh, it is appalling what happened in this situation. It is appalling for them to say, well, we had to, you know, pull this job because she's not in keeping with the Catholic mission of Marquette she's University. Not. She's taught for 15 years at another Jesuit university where she's the chairwoman of her department, where in fact they went to that Jesuit university. University and recruited her to come to Marquette. Uh, it is it is appalling that the new archbishop is moving the Archdiocese of Milwaukee. Oh, so, I didn't say that so it was far, appalling that he was so moving it in that direction. The hard right. I, I that think he it's, interferes in the administration of Marquette. And, and that, that is his and responsibility that, and that father, to do that. No, he does not that run is Marquette. His, no, that is his responsibility. He does not run He absolutely has a role to he does play. Not, he can say what anything is, he wants, but he doesn't and, run Marquette. And, and as the the Bishop the of this diocese, Wilde yes, he does have a say in what happens there. She teaches at a Catholic university. This is not a woman uh, who is uh, out of grant keeping that. with the Jesuit mission. Well, and, let's, and let's be frank. Not twice. all Catholic institutions it is against, share a it common is vision. the That's law true. in the state of Wisconsin to discriminate on the basis of sexual well, orientation. Well, I, I doubt, I doubt <laughs> very much. Marquette university, Just what Marquette, Marquette did. University has gotten an enormous black eye out of this whole thing. I doubt very much they discriminated against her because she was sure gay. Did. I would bet they have dozens of gay professors. Yes, they do. They they looked into her research. Liberal people they looked into her research, and it was a little more liberal than they felt. Yeah, and and, and and well, I, I think the problem. I, I think he was looking at me, but uh, go ahead. I, I give my time. I give my time to these Callow thank you, thank for you. our <laughs> weekly lecture from that side. Of, <laughs> that side of the dais. It's not a lecture. You're going to be surprised by this, Kevin. <laughs> I, I agree that Marquette is a private institution, and it has the ability to do what it wants to do. To me, that's not the issue. The issue is that it appeared that either she wasn't properly vetted or they weren't paying attention. And someone said, oops, did we realize all of the teachings and writings that this particular professor has, has out there in the public domain? It's a combination of both. And, and they didn't thoroughly vet her, and they did discover a few things later that, right. that so, raised their eyebrows. So, After so two I searches, think that, they knew everything I, about her. Well, but they may have known it, but maybe they weren't paying attention. Who knows? But they certainly are paying attention now because this has become a huge public relations mess for them. It is. This thing is just not going to die. The best thing they can do is move more quickly than they have been to reach some kind of settlement with her because they're going to have to do that. They, sure they signed the contract, she signed the contract, and be able to move on. That they need to put this behind themselves quickly because it is just dragging on. And the worst thing any institution wants to do when it comes to attracting faculty, whether their views are on the left or on the right, is have people question whether or not their academic freedom 
is going to be impinged if they associate. Well, all but I, I, think a lot of, I, I think a lot of Catholics who who are friends of Marquette it, want Marquette to question no, you're, what their what their research. Now you're pointing at me. Is this at. another indication that is Denise's <laughs> turn? Take it away, Kevin. <laughs> Look. Ultimately, they did the right thing. They fumbled the ball many times, but they did the right thing because they stood up for the principles and beliefs and convictions of a Catholic university, and they said, she does not comply. Right. Now, they didn't and, handle and the situation Seattle well. They, isn't they didn't that. handle this. I don't care about Seattle University. We're talking about Marquette, and God okay. love them for doing the right thing. The it is university? a PR nightmare. They didn't handle it right. They didn't vet her right. They offered her the job, that they, which they it should have never gotten that far. They shouldn't right. have had serious discussions with her and and they should then they wouldn't have been in the position of rescinding the job which makes them look bad then you've got the pc crowd who is like joel who's going to say she deserves the job no matter what but in the end they did the right thing and yes it's a controversy but not as bad as when they changed that nickname where i believe <laughs> in this case the marquette faithful will stand behind marquette mm -hmm. right. whereas in that case and laugh if you will but i think that was a bigger controversy because they because changing the name of a yeah, team because, is is worse he, than discriminating against someone. He didn't someone discriminate. And yes, if you let me answer that, yes, because in this case, the Marquette faithful believe uh, that Marquette did the right thing. In the nickname situation, the Marquette faithful were ready to withhold their their checks. All right. Next topic. How about the MATC, Milwaukee Area Technical College Board of Directors, voting the other day not to do any business with any state of Arizona companies because they don't like the new Arizona law aimed at cracking down on illegal immigrants. A pretty meaningless, politically correct move, which will accomplish absolutely nothing. So, is this simply MATC pandering to the Hispanic community? from which the school draws a lot of its students. And if you look at it that way, Denise, does it make sense that they're doing this? Well, I, I think there's also, I, I'm not quite that cynical. I think there's a matter of principle that's involved. Um, and as we've talked about before on this issue, it, it's adding their name, their voice to the idea that this boycott needs to take place. I don't think it's pandering. I do think there's on a higher level the, the MATC board standing up for what it believes is something that's incorrect and voicing its collective opinion on it. Is it something that some students are going to agree with? Yes, but I think students agree with this whether they're Latino or African American or Asian or Caucasian. There are people who believe that this law is wrong, that people need to stand up and say that it's wrong and that it's improper and inappropriate, and that's what the MATC board is doing. Um, as much uh, on behalf of its students as it is on, obviously, what a majority of the board feels is an important critical issue where it needs to weigh in. Should, shouldn't the board's concern be education and not this stuff? Well, I don't think the board's response was well thought out. Um, I happen to be one that uh, doesn't have the same kinds of concerns that some others have with regards to the Arizona law. I think when you begin to talk about boycotts and, and the implications of boycotts, um, there were certainly far too many who sat around that table that did not understand what that law uh, entailed, uh, just as many in the federal administration who, when asked had they read the law, couldn't uh, admit uh, that they had read the law or even given it more than just a cursory perusal. I, 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 I also think that when you begin to talk about we're not going to do business with uh, a state or businesses that are located in that state, someone should have gone back and had taken a look at those Wisconsin institutions that have significant operations in Arizona and whether or not those states are going to be hit hard whether or not people ultimately, as a result of these boycotts, are going to lose jobs, and if that offsets then the, um, uh, the, the, the harm that they perceive the law is going to do. Boy, boycotts are supposed to hurt. Well, West, boy, boycotts but, but are, are supposed, supposed that's to That's the reason you have a the boycott. That you're trying to um, the, it, they're supposed to hurt. Uh, this, this state made this decision to have this racial profiling law. And, and, it, was not uh, racial and it was against a third of the population of that state, as a matter of fact. It was like two thirds against the one third minority. Uh, and all across the country, uh, cities, uh, universities, uh, boards like MATC are participating in the boycott to express their opinion about that. Uh, and I, I, I certainly hope that it does hurt. Uh, and, and, you know, innocent people. What, it, what, it, it has to hurt in order for the people 
of the state to rise up and say, we can't pass a law against a third of our citizens. Uh, we can't do that. You want people to be unemployed? Uh, I, I, think it hurts no, the, I, think it, I think it hurts the image of MATC when the board does something You know, like it's this. silly. Come on. Uh, Denise <laughs> Calloway, Joel McNally, uh, Dan Jones, you. Kevin Fisher, we've all covered the Milwaukee Common Council and the Milwaukee County Board when they pass these cockamamie resolutions uh, that we oppose this and we oppose it. It means nothing. You think they care in the state of Arizona that the they MATC board... conventions. Do you think they care that the MATC board doesn't like their law? They could care less. Then now they, what they do care is when the city council in Los Angeles says that we should boycott uh, Arizona. What does Arizona do? They reciprocate and they say, mm -hmm. well, maybe we're going to shut off your electricity, uh, Los Angeles. And you, you mentioned that, hey, you know, it, turnabout is fair play. And maybe Arizona plays hardball with, with all of these other entities that want to boycott Arizona. The other point is that the vast majority of Americans support this law. Over 70%. And the more, you, the more <laughs> the, there's talk of boycott, the more uh, entities that say we need to boycott Arizona, you know what that indignation does? It hardens the resolve of the vast majority of people in this country who have adopted a zero-tolerance stance about people being in this country illegally. So bring on your boycotts. They're backfiring. You, you they know, don't that's, that's work. That's what South Africa said about the apartheid boycott. It's very, uh, very different circumstance. It's not very It is. It is similar. absolutely a different circumstance. The, 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 the problem with this, though, is that it's not addressing the issue that all of us and everybody in Arizona and people around the country agree, and that is that we do not have a comprehensive immigration reform policy that addresses these issues and allows us to move beyond it. We're going to see things like the Arizona law and other things like this happening that grow out of people's frustration, but at the end of the day, don't do a darn thing to solve the root issue and root problem. You know, we need to put our energy into that, um, not necessarily if they keep illegals, bring that on. If they uh, let's bring illegal, immigration reform. If they on. frighten illegals, which which you understand to be amnesty, and I'm not for that. If you frighten illegals into staying on their side of the border, that's a victory. And 17 states now are thinking about Arizona type resolutions. If you frighten 12 wow. or 14 million people into hiding in the shadows, uh, that that's doesn't, fine with that me. Doesn't, no, it's not fine with you. Uh, it really it is isn't. fine with me uh, you, because those people become victims. Those people. Uh, in Employers exploit them. Uh, employers treat them illegally and bring down the wages of everybody. Uh, we we do need comprehensive. No, we okay, need we, we, we we really need do legal immigration, more legal immigration. We That's really we do need. only have about a minute, so we have to touch on this uh, Ron Johnson guy from Oshkosh. He's a zillionaire. Can he? He's galvanized. Can he put, yes. can he put he's up galvanized a fight? Republicans. He's can a Herb he Cole Feingold? type. I say no. Uh, a Herb Cole. Uh, 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 Feingold is vulnerable, as many of the incumbents are. I think he's still going to win, but this guy's going to give him a shot because of he's he's got that Herb. Nobody Kolab. knows anything about this guy. He bought the nomination because he says I'm going to spend 15 million dollars, but no one still knows. Well, no, he, about well, he, he did not buy the today. nomination. He absolutely did. He did. No, he did not. He, the, the nomination came about because the candidates that were already in the were field terrible. were, were subpar, given. The, the Republicans' opportunity to capture that seat. And they knew that any one of those weaknesses of the, of the candidates that were already in the field could have been exploited by the Democrats. And then they... And he's always... Nobody, 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 knows, knows, anything about, nobody knows anything about him, and that's what's going to make this... You don't know anything no, about no, him. Let, let me finish. That's what's going to make this an interesting race. And I think that's what's going to draw people's attention to it, because they do want to find out more about him in this year that's going to be tough for any incumbent, no matter what party you're he from. He just entered I the think race. The thing that's he just entered the race, and he's only two points behind Feingold. Democrats are starting though, to get scared. To see <laughs> what happens when in Wisconsin, if you find what you had in Kentucky with Rand Paul, where you have somebody who's untried in this type of big political arena, and one misstep becomes a real problem. So and, we'll see and, what and happens. And misstep after misstep becomes even more of a problem. All right, let's move from the Senate race to the other big uh, contest in Wisconsin this year. Who's going to succeed Jim Doyle as governor? Scott Walker. The airways are already heating up in this one in some pretty surprising ways. At least that's how Rick Horowitz sees it. Rick. You know, Dan, every now and again, you can actually learn something from watching political ads on TV, even when it's not the main point of the ad. Take the uh, paper dolly ad that some Democratic group has been running against the Republicans' two candidates for governor, Scott Walker and Mark Newman. 
at least I assume it's some Democratic group. It's got one of those totally nondescript names, you know, uh, Citizens for Really Good Government and Lots of Freedom or something. And it never even mentions Tom Barrett, but who else but the Democrats would put up an ad attacking both Walker and Newman. You've seen the ad, right? It starts out with this cutesy music and two paper dolls, one of Walker and one of Newman. And then they stick a yellow hard hat on Newman's head and a brown paper bag in Walker's hand. And then it becomes this big, long string of paper dolls, Walker and Newman alternating, while the announcer tells you about some of their more controversial positions on taxes and budgets and such. And then at the very end, all the Walker and Newman dolls turn into Bush and Cheney dolls. And the announcer says something like, we can't afford to make those same mistakes again. But that's not the most interesting part. The most interesting part is just one word tucked into the middle of the ad. Uh, Walker did such and such, the ad says, and Congressman Newman voted for such and such else. Congressman Newman. They want you to know he was a congressman. The Democrats want you to know that. And to me, that's the most interesting part of the whole ad. See, most years, Mark Newman would be talking about his congressional experience, but the anti-Washington fever has climbed so high this year that Newman would much rather call himself a businessman, a home builder, just another average Joe outsider, anything but a politician. So it's left to the Democrats to bring up this dark nugget from the guy's past to deliver the ultimate insult. He used to be Congressman Newman. Talk about going negative. Thank you, Rick. And thank you so much for watching. Okay. Rick is done. Have okay. a wonderful holiday weekend. He's been done for a long time.